Abu Bakr is a successful businessman with interest in hospitality, oil and gas, agriculture and mining sector of the Nigeria economy. He is an executive director at Grand Ibro Hotel Abuja, managing director, CEO of Ira Integrated Resource Limited Abuja. Abu Bakr holds a master degree in international affairs and diplomacy between the year 2002 to 2003 and postgraduate diploma in management between the year 1999 to 2001, both from Amadou Bello University, Zaria. Earlier in 1997, he obtained BSc in agriculture also from Amadou Bello University and he was deployed to the Ministry of Agriculture, FCT Abuja, for his mandatory one-year National Youth Service call between 1997 to 1998. Abubakar was recently turbaned as Ochada Onu Ife and Waziri Jakadan Sokoto among his many titles. He also recently backed an honorary doctorate degree by African Theological Education Network in affiliation with Vision International University. Abu Bakr was born on the 25th of April 1968 in Zaria. Abu Bakr is happily married to Barista Rekia, a lawyer from Kogi Central Senatorial District and blessed with five children. In a lot of ways, uh, everybody's uh, birthday seems special uh, because it comes just once a year and um, it reminds you um, of the very first day you came into the world. You breathe your first um, sign of air uh, onto Earth. So uh, you can't have more than one birthday. So. Uh, which makes the world of difference. So that's why, um, for me, uh, it, it takes me, it brings sober moments, sober uh, moments and reflective moments of um, when you actually came to the world and uh, 54 years later, uh, who you are now, and you know, you, it tends to, make you reminisce about um, growing, growing up uh, from a baby to a child, to a toddler, then a teenager, a man, married man, and um, a father, and um, hopefully a grandfather. So uh, this, a day like this um, brings so much to bear. You know, in just um, in just one simple stance, I think um, it's a day of reflection, really, of you know your whole entire life. You should be able to put in the very best you can at um, any given opportunity. Um, you should be able to extend a helping hand when you can to your fellow human being, especially when you realize that not um, everybody is the same. You know. Um, some people are more privileged than others, so um, one guiding principle is to be able to put a smile um, on the faces of those you can put a smile on. Um, of course, you cannot do it for everyone, but then, you know, um, 
if you can go feeling happy that I have been able to achieve this or I've done this for um, people um, goes a long way and by extension you know when you look at it critically try and be happy try and be happy with yourself because that's the first uh, principle about life. You have to be happy with yourself before you're able to extend it outside. If, you, if, if you're not, then um, you can't give any other person what you don't have as a person. So, yeah. Alhaji Abu Bakr Ibrahim Idris is an erudite businessman, a notable politician from Icheke Ward, Omala local government, Kogi East Senatorial District. In 2019, Abu Bakr aspired to be governor of Kogi State, coming second in the People's Democratic Party primaries for the 2019 Kogi State governorship election. Abu Bakr is the first son of His Excellency Al Haji Ibrahim Idris, former governor of Kogi State, he had then responded to the nudge by his constituents following his good track record of philanthropic engagement with various groups, particularly at the grassroots. Again, they are beckoning on him to throw his hat in the ring to contest. In the 2023 through 2024 governorship race, knowing that he only narrowly lost in the previous exercise due to some intrigue. One was the fact that um, a lot of people believed in my ability to be able to um, run the state. And they believed I had the capacity. And they believed, uh, you know, I had the know how. But most importantly, um, for me, I felt my exposure. Um, educational background. Um, of course, the environment um, I grew up in, it, it was a business come political environment. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that um, I also had people in the political cir circle that would be able to be there at any point in time T to be able to say or tell me or advise on what is right and what is wrong. Um, but most importantly, I, I felt my exposure to government, uh, even though at the background, vis-a-vis um, -vis my my experience in the business world and um, finally uh, my exposure and my education you know were all pointers to the fact that yes um, I would have been able to handle run effectively uh, the state, of course, with the right, with the right team. Naturally, you wouldn't feel good about losing. Nobody likes losing, you know. 
Um, but for me, I looked at it from a spiritual point of view, and I felt, well, um, that was what was best for me. God gave me that which was best for me then. Um, because, you know, as you propose, God disposes. So, um, every pointer pointed to the fact that, I mean, I would win. But uh, with what had happened, proved um, otherwise. So, uh, when you look at that critically, that tends to tell you that, look, um, uh, it wasn't God's time. And so, to that, uh, you, you, you tend to wait for God's time, which they say is the best. So I took it with, uh, with a good heart that, um, you know, um, the fact that I didn't uh, make it then doesn't mean I wasn't going to make it in future. So as tough as it was, I took it with good faith. My next plan, well, that would again depend on our people because um, they beckoned me then because they saw qualities in me that you know could propel the state so um, uh, if, if they come again and um, say that I should go ahead and run uh, why not if not but like right now it will depend on um, the decision of our people because I'm coming to govern if I'm coming as to govern, I'm governing them so they should um, decide if I should you know go ahead and run um, or not Let me try and break it down like into five components or five um, uh, points. And the first being food, agriculture. You know, we need to try and make our state very self-sufficient in food because uh, you know there's this old saying: a hungry man is an angry man, and um, a hungry man is a devil's workshop. So if you're able to try and conquer um, food, you would have taken care of um, a very good amount of, um, uh, you would have been able to mitigate a lot of problems in that process. Um, a very close second would be to be able to educate the, the education sector. You know. Um, because if you notice, most of these advanced countries are uh, advanced because of their, their, the, the, the educational sector in, in, in these countries has, um, is way up, you understand? Um, when you look at the 10 richest countries in the world, they're not rich because of their natural resources or their... Or, um, um, other things that they probably have that other countries don't have. But what stands out for them is the level of education of their people. Because that's what brings about um, other things like technology and um, um, uh, human capital development. Uh, typical example, Israel literally does not have anything. But thanks to their education, of the 12 biggest tech companies in the world, Israel owns six. You know, and that couldn't have been achieved without a sound education. So yes, coming on a close back of agriculture would be education. Third would be medical health care. 
because I mean our people need to be very healthy to be able to perform their day-to-day -day, uh, dealings in, in life. Um, we should be able to have a scenario whereby even in the most remotest of clinics there should be there should be, even if it is painkillers and anti-malarials, do you understand? They should be able to clean up wounds caused from domestic accidents, you know, without having to travel kilometers to general hospitals, you know. Um, out, a fourth will be the infrastructure. We'll have to work on the infrastructure so that um, we'll try to a, a, a very good extent to be able to make um, we get we, we get connectivity between um, different villages and you know with the urban settlements because once there is that you know and infrastructure basic infrastructures generally you know it takes care of um, all that not forgetting human capital development because again you need to develop humans or the uh, people, do you understand, to achieve some of these uh, feats. And last but not the least, also to address the insecurity problem because that again is a huge, huge um, minus for our communities. <laughs>
you understand? It saves a lot of manpower, saves a lot of energy, saves a lot of um, finances. Even though initially it could be, I mean, technology, yes, it's expensive. I mean, let's face it. But when you look at it in the long run, it's actually cheaper than what you, know, you have doing. Like I just give a typical scenario now that why would I have to send, what, 200 vigilantes or 500 vigilantes to go into the forest trying to comb um, hideouts, you know, when I can actually s get drones that can pinpoint up to facial recognition, you know, uh, suspects that you're actually looking for. And you, they, they can stay up there for 48 to 72 hours doing what <laughs> 400 or 500 people ideally would be doing. Message. Uh, I know our people have gone through so much. Um, they've gone through some very trying uh, moments in the last couple of years. Um, but I want to tell them that um, there's, there's, there's always light at the end of every tunnel. After the darkest nights come the brightest days, you know. And for every hardship, there will always be some form of relief. So they can be rest assured that um, they, they should keep hope alive. You know, everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to get better than, you know, what they are currently going through at the moment.